Andrew Crystal with you. This is Crystal Nation. Only on Channel 167, Sirius XM. 50 years ago this summer, a California murder spree introduced the world to Charles Manson. In 1969, Manson, a 32-year-old petty criminal who spent most of his life either behind bars or in youth detention centers, became the leader of a small cult. That cult, which later became known as the Manson family, conducted a series of cold-blooded, grisly murders in Hollywood, which included the actress Sharon Tate, who was almost nine months pregnant at the time of her murder. Ultimately, nine people were killed in four locations by Manson. The murders and Manson himself later became immortalized as the face of evil following the publication of Helter Skelter, the best-selling true crime book on the murders by California prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi. Today, 50 years after those events, many still struggle with what happened and why, especially the achievement of the prosecution in achieving a guilty conviction on Manson where Manson was miles away from the murder scene in some instances. With Sharon Tate, he was 40 miles away. California prosecutors established Manson's guilt by his overt mind control of the cult, what later became known as the Helter Skelter Theory. That name taken from the Beatles' White Album, where Manson was said to believe that secret messages in the Beatles' recordings gave him inspiration and the idea to blame his group's murders on black Americans, which would then incite a race war. Now, what makes the Manson story even more bizarre is Manson's murky association with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, who created a song with the band prior to the murders and Manson's own behavior. Very bizarre. Manson's behavior in the courtroom 50 years ago, which also included having himself and his members carve axes into each of their foreheads with razor blades. Later, Manson carved that forehead X into a swastika. And all of this became part of the legendary crime history and Manson lore. Joining me to discuss is true crime reporter and documentarian James Buddy Day. Mr. Day is the last person to interview Manson. Manson died in prison of natural causes in 2017. And James Buddy Day's upcoming book, Hippie Cult Leader, re-examines what happened 50 years ago in Los Angeles and why. And Day also sheds light on the nature of the prosecution's conviction. James Buddy Day, welcome. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. So, Buddy, can I call you Buddy or what do you prefer? Yeah, you can call me Buddy. Most people do. So, what goes through your mind 50 years ago, the summer of 69, July and August, where we sit today? With that distance, what what goes through your mind? You go back into the vault, you're looking at this anniversary, what do you think of? You know, I think the Manson story has just become such a part of Americana, like Lizzie Borden or Billy the Kid. And 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 for me it's it's set in this really unique world of the nineteen sixties. Uh everything about it oozes the nineteen sixties. And and for me it's just such a source of fascination that something like that could happen in that time and because it's become almost folklore this time it's it's an endless source of of just curiosity of what really happened for me now your book hippie cult leader the last words of charles manson we're not going to get into details of this book because it's currently under embargo i am holding an advanced copy uh the book is being published early in august yeah august 8th uh it comes out uh friday august 8th which is uh the 50th anniversary of the manson family murders so we don't want to get too far into it but you have a very interesting perspective on Manson and the murders and the time and the period. Uh, so I don't want to get into that thesis. I want to talk about your feelings about Manson, about, get, about getting up close and personal with one of America's most famous serial killers. All right. <laughs> yeah. Underwhelming? Scary? Boring? At first, I think it was just surreal. You know, uh, when I first spoke to Manson on the phone, uh, it was just this, I couldn't believe that Charles Manson, the most notorious mass murdering serial killer of all time, was calling me. And at first I thought it'd just be a a story I'd tell at parties. And then when he kept calling and I started to get to know him, 
it became very real. I mean, at times it was scary. At times it was surreal. At times it was fascinating. It was it was a host of emotions. I think we're gonna play a clip that you brought uh, brought to us. Sure. Uh, regarding uh, Manson. Uh, calling you because you would get these calls like at all hours. Yeah, at all hours. Whenever he'd get phone time, uh, he was in and out of the hospital that last year. So if he'd had phone time in the hospital, if they bring him a phone, he'd give me a call. If he had phone time in the prison, he'd give me a call. When you call from California, you can only talk to the person uh, for 15 minutes at a time. Uh, whatever I was doing, I just had to, He he. I could never call him. He had to call me. So I just had to drop whatever I was doing. So he called me at Thanksgiving dinner. He called me when I was putting my kids to bed. He'd call me when I was at work just all the time. And I'd have to constantly excuse myself and say. To talk, excuse me. <laughs> Charles Manson is yeah. calling, honey. Yeah. Can you keep the turkey warm yeah. for me? I got a quick call from Charlie. So Here's, one, here's what some of that audio sounded like. You have a prepaid call from Charles, an inmate at the California State Prison, Corcoran, Corcoran, California. To accept this call, say or dial five now. Hello? Oh, hello, hello. Tell me about the rambles. Like, what was his conditions? Paranoid schizophrenic? Yeah. What was his deal? Well, you know, it, it changed from conversation to conversation. Sometimes he was a good conversationalist. We'd have back and forth. Sometimes he just wanted to talk. Uh, I remember once he just called me and just launched into this 15-minute diatribe that, you know, almost made no sense. It was as if he's gibberish. been speaking to you for hours, right? Yeah, yeah. He just, you know, he, he just, as if we were in the middle of a conversation, he was just talking about Obama and talking about the pyramids in Egypt and Mexico, just all over the place. And and then other times he'd call and say, hey, man, what's up? And we just talk about whatever. Now, you say that the, the actual, the girls in the group mm -hmm. were actually the most wicked, the most treacherous, the most evil. They'd stab you in the back without thinking twice. That's what uh, prosecutor Stephen Kay said. To Is me. that your belief? Yeah. I would say no. I don't think that's my belief. I mean, I think the scary thing about the women in the Manson family is that what they went through could happen to anyone is that they are like any of us, anyone that was part of that group and that situation and that time could have done the same things that they did. See my belief, and we'll talk about mind control in our follow-up interview. Mm -hmm. This is, we're doing a little teaser for, <laughs> with James buddy day. His upcoming book is called hippie cult leader. It's out August 8th. Look for it. The last words of Charles Manson, James buddy day documentarian, the last person to speak to to interview uh, Charles Manson. My take on it is no Manson, no murders. In other words, as bad as these people were in the Manson cult, mm -hmm. that Manson's overt control of these people would have meant that they would have been just casually crazy. But yeah. he was able to mold them into robotic killers. Well, I disagree with a lot of that. Okay. Um, but That's why we have you on. <laughs> Otherwise, it would just be me talking to myself. Yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, he, you know, there's no question that I'm, I'm not a Manson apologist. I'm not saying that of course Manson you're is, not. is a patsy, and, and I'm not saying he was not involved. There's no doubt that he was a catalyst of that group and a catalyst for the subsequent murders. But I think the murders themselves were a comb combination of events and they would have happened, they would not have happened without Manson, but they wouldn't have happened without Tex. They wouldn't have happened without many other people. He might have committed murders, but they would have been in a different format. Yeah, I mean, there was a, a host of reasons that those murders took place. Manson was one of them. Now, these girls were super whack jobs. I mean, I the news footage of them outside the courtroom chanting shaved heads. I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean... This is, I, I've gotten to know them really well over the years, many of them, not all of them. And um, I mean, I, I think the most fascinating thing about them is how normal they are when you actually get to know them, you know, and, and how and how. And the other thing I find really fascinating is, is this false idea that Manson somehow recruited normal young women and turned them into serial killers, you know, through. They some were already sort of disturbed, right? Well, they, I mean, they all have really unique tragic backstories. Um, they all went through, I mean, you look at Leslie Van Houten, who's one of the the murder the murderers of uh, the LaBianca family, Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. I mean, she went through a very tragic upbringing. Her parents were divorced. She got pregnant. Her mother made her have a backroom abortion. They buried the fetus in the backyard, you know, 110 feet away from where she had breakfast. Patricia Krenwinkel's parents divorced. Her sister was a heroin addict and died skinny dipping in a lake. I mean, all of them have these kind of tragic things in their backstory story that made them right ripe for a person but like to stab me. An, an innocent human being in cold-blooded mm -hmm. murder how do you sit and how do you interview that 
to stab someone. Like, I have trouble yeah. working working with Zach, who's just sitting here on the board. <laughs> he hasn't killed anybody. Well, how do you sit down? I've met a <laughs> lot. I mean, I've met a how, lot. How do, you, how do you sit down with someone you know stabbed an innocent victim to death and, was, and, and took part mm-hmm. in the murder of a pregnant woman and, and her baby? How I mean, do you sit there? I mean, working in true crime, I've done a lot of prison interviews and met a lot of inmates and serial killers. So, I mean, I approach every interview... You know, I tried to find the human connection. I don't, I don't think anyone is just pure evil. I think everybody is human and everyone has a story to tell. And, I, and so, I'm sorry that they all weren't shot right away <laughs> within 20 minutes of conviction. Well, I think, I think there's, there's a fundamental misunderstanding. That, and I think it's easy to put them in a box and say they're monsters and they're evil. And, well, but what and, they did was. Well, what they did was definitely, yeah, I mean, there's nothing you can say that's good about it. I mean, them. Hitler liked, liked his dog Blondie, right? Mm-hmm. So what? Like you know, well, I think it's what it's what their actions I think, cause. It's, it's their it's their you know action defines character as we know, right? So yeah, but I think in I I see what you're saying, but I think intent definitely matters. Well, context for you, definitely for you matters. to do your job as a documentarian, yeah. If you go in with the hate I do and the disdain, <laughs> you can't do the work. Well, also I don't think that's the way society works. I mean, I mean, intent it completely matters in our judicial system. I mean, there's a difference between the biggest difference between first degree murder and second degree murder and manslaughter, and is intent. You know, intent, context, uh, reason, uh, the the circumstances surrounding murder are incredibly know, but, important to but all. But Nuremberg, of us. the trials at Nuremberg in 1945, disabused people of the notion that. You are you get a get out of jail free card just because of extreme conditioning that you should mm-hmm. choose and you know inherently what is good and what is right and what is moral and saying I only followed orders or well you know what I had a bad upbringing so I decided to stab a pregnant woman doesn't cut it yeah and no one no one is saying that the the Manson women should be absolved of their no, of their actions that they did like but, I, I yeah totally but do agree. to do an interview with these people. And to get anything out of it, Mm -hmm. you have to have a different mindset than what I'm talking about. Well, me sitting here, it's talking to I'm talking to you, the the documentarian. Yeah, it's easy for me to get all pissed off at the murderers, which (laughs) of course, because I wouldn't do what you do. Yeah, right. Which is which is, and I admire you doing it because you are, in terms of human nature and and the conditions of this, I, I I do think that it's you help by creating context, and I think you ultimately prevent other murders, if I can be idealistic about what you do. Well, I thank, thank you for that credit. But yeah, I think, I think psychopathology, ultraviolence, murder, these things have always fascinated me, and, and I think it, it's a disservice not to explore yeah. them and but find out why. you got a great stomach. you got out. a great stomach better than mine. I had trouble, just to let you know what a wimp I am. I had trouble. <laughs> Dean Baxter, the publisher, was talking to me about the book, and I said, Dean, because I was getting, I got mad at him because there were parts of the book I had difficulty reading. Mm-hmm. When the Manson family break into the, the Sharon Tate's home, yeah, and they're stalking her or whatever, you know, it was I had trouble reading it. I found it difficult. I was, it was creepy, and yeah. that's why it's in the commercials. You know, I say don't read about Manson alone because, you know. I've seen lots of horror movies, right? Yeah. This book scared me. There are elements of this book that I didn't want to read, chapters that I didn't want to read. To prepare for this interview, I read what I needed to. <laughs> and I, it's, a, it's well written. Thank it's a, you. It's a good book. I, yeah. And I'm, prou- I'm proud of, of the whole, this whole project. It's a privilege to have you on air with me. Thanks, man. But it's difficult. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's horror. It really is bad. When you know that the bad guys are in the house... And these innocents are going to get killed. It's tough. I think there's no question that the murder of Sharon Tate and the rest and her friends who are in that house is brutal, vicious, ugly, disturbing. And there's no question. It's it's horrible. But to me, it's important to understand it does a disservice to the victims if you don't understand why everything really happened and if you just brush it under the rug and so, say now they knew about yeah. this house they knew about this house yeah well let's, te- why yeah. Did, why did charlie manson all right let's because i don't want to get into the details sure. of the book yeah. but i want to approach it first of all, i got a million questions i can't <laughs> do it now so next week or in august in august we'll tell you Stay tuned for the full hour of James Buddy Day and his book, Hippie Cult Leader, The Last Words of Charles Manson. How did, tell me, because yeah. what connected Manson to the house where Sharon Tate was staying in yeah. 
was the was Terry Melcher, yes, one of the producers of Beach Boys, and Dennis Wilson. How did Manson, Freak Boy, get to connect with one of the Beach Boys? Oh, so uh, two of his. Uh Two of the women that were part of the Manson commune, uh, Ella Jo Bailey and Patricia Krenwinkel, uh, were hitchhiking. And Terry, Dennis Wilson just picked them up. They were hitchhiking in, I think, Sunset Boulevard. And Dennis Wilson was driving by in his Rolls Royce and picked them up. Uh, they went back to his house. He had sex with them? We're not sure. Allegedly, he had some. Given their track one, record, one was, I would say that's a yes. Yeah, one was pregnant. He was single at the time. Allegedly, they had sex or something like yeah. that. Uh, they went back, told Charlie and the rest of the group. They came back to Dennis Wilson's house. He invited them to stay there. Oh, God. Uh, they all stayed there for several months. Uh, and at the time, wow. Terry Melcher was uh, one of Dennis Wilson's friends. And Dennis said, hey, man, I'm having this never-ending party at my mansion in the Pacific Palisades. And Dennis Wilson just came on over. And, and they basically, the family was living there and just partying for Days and days. I mean, just literally a never-ending party, and and Terry Melcher just showed up. And Terry Melcher's lucky he didn't get killed himself. Yeah, I mean, he just he after the murders, he was terrified. He uh, he went into hiding. It was uh, he was incredibly disturbed. Okay, Hippie Cult Leader is the book, The Last Words of Charles Manson. Before we bring you back for the full hour interview, getting in depth in the murders and probing Manson's sick mind. Anything you want to add before we leave? No, I think you can get the book, uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, wherever fine books are sold. And thanks for having me on. Look for it August 8th, and I'll be back with more of James Buddy Day when he returns for the full hour interview on Hippie Cult Leader. 50 years since the Manson's murders, one of the most notorious serial killers and representatives of evil in American culture. Thanks, James Buddy Day. 